we, we're going to talk about a little bit of your work, of course, in Lenin, Stalin, anti-imperialism, and, and, and communism in general. Let me just go to the first question. Your work reflects on the possible communist horizons and the possibility of the masses acting as a, re a revolutionary subject, right? And yesterday we had Lenin's death anniversary, and today we celebrate actually Grinch's birthday. So for you, what lessons can we learn from Lenin that can be applied today? Well, his concepts of the vanguard party and anti-parallelist struggle adapt today to the struggle of the first world countries or not? I think that one of the most important things that we learn from Lenin, um, and, and, and it's a lesson that I think too many, particularly on the left in the imperialist countries, like just abandon, is that you have to organize, right? There's a way that um, a kind of strange common sense settled in on, on the left in the last 30 or 40 years, which is just totally, you know, spontaneous. It, more, it thinks that things like organized commitment to a struggle are necessarily um, constraining rather than enabling. And so I think the A number one, absolutely most important thing um, that we have to continue to take from Lenin is the utter imperative of organiz of organizing and organization. And, and the thing is, is like, as soon as one begins there, a lot of things mentally, conceptually, um, they start to change, right? You start to realize that a whole bunch of different things that pass as critique on parts of the left actually are not particularly interesting or relevant because they don't have anything to do with with organizing with how are you trying to build a collective force capable of taking on power and winning so i think that um the focus on organizing also it starts to install a lot of clarity and redirect thought in a way that has the potential to to actually be something to actually be a material force so Slavoj Zizek writes that if we want to renew the communist project as a real alternative to the global capitalism, we have to mark a clear break with the communist experience of the 20th century. So looking at the development of the productive forces in the new century of intense globalization, do you see this statement as correct? And if so, how can we renew this project? To be honest, I'm not 100% sure what he means by a clear break. I mean, the... Um, you know, the Soviet Union no longer exists. If that's not a clear break, you know, I don't know what is. Um, maybe what he, um, maybe he wants a break from, um, a clear break from a Eurocentric focus on communism and one that is utterly invested with the struggles, the communist struggles everywhere else in the world, right? Why would anybody want to break? I mean, the, so a break with the European project, maybe, maybe that's what he means, but, I don't think that's I don't think that break is the right word. I think shift in focus to where the inspiration comes from. Right? What about the ongoing parties and struggles that have that didn't fall apart or collapse in 1991? So I, just to be to be really clear on this, I'm not 100 percent sure what he means by um, by a full break here. And, and the thing is, I actually. You know, I don't think it's even consistent in his work, considering that he continues to draw inspiration from Lenin, right? Yeah. I mean, if it was going to be a clear break, then why would he still be writing through Lenin rather than actually making the break that he calls for? So I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to talk in terms of a break. I think it makes sense to be inspired by the ongoing nature of struggles against capitalism and struggles against imperialism to be inspired by the comrades who have been willing to, you know, basically have been willing to die in this struggle. And I don't want to break from them. I want to hold them up and let them continue to inspire us. Mm -hmm. And talking about this inspiration, Domenico Losurdo, the Italian philosopher, outlines the concept of autophagy within the left, where the defeated and assuming the characteristics and vices of the dominant ideology no longer carry out a constructive self-criticism, self but are filled with almost a Christian guilt, you know, uh, filled with the ideology that's dominant. So do you see this autophagy inside the left today? And within our field, what do you consider most dangerous? The deviations from the right that end up murdering the revolutionary horizon or the deviations from the left that lead to sectarianism? Um, I, I guess I want to say neither. 
um, neither of those. Um, and let me explain why. So I actually think that the charge of sectarianism is really overblown, that it's an excuse that kind of unaffiliated left liberals used to try to um, justify their own failure to commit and to put their life behind the kinds of criticisms that and calls that they make. So, you know, there's a there's a kind of of left wing pose where the person goes on and on and on about the horrors of you know, capitalism and fascism and imperialism and then the demand for revolution and total change and wiping everything out. And yet they don't put anything of their own life behind that. Um, and instead, it's like, well, you know, there's no party, all the parties split, everyone's sectarian. It's like, well, you know, if you don't, if you don't try to be engaged in the struggle in a concrete and material and organized way, then then you're not doing anything, right? You're just adding to a media sphere rather than participating in the struggle. So, so my first pass through your question is I, I think that um, the sectarian claim is really overblown and that um, on the left, we shouldn't be raising it against each other, right? Instead, what we need to do is to build what we have. And when there's opportunities to work with other parts of, um, let's say, the broader progressive milieu, then do that. And when we don't see a time, then continue doing the work that we think is the most valuable. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, the, and the, the reason I don't want to say that the uh, talk about like the new danger of the right is, you know, fascism has been a problem for over 70 years. <laughs> and so the, this isn't new. It's not like, oh, you know, all of a sudden Bolsonaro and Trump and then, you know, the parties in Hungary and Poland and then the, you know, freaking Boris Johnson, in the UK, that these are brand new developments, right? They are part of a long legacy that goes back into the first half of the 20th century at the, at the, I mean, at the soonest, right? We can mark it even, even further if we want. But I think that like, to, to, to try to talk about that is new is a mistake. It acts as if, oh, guess what, everyone? There was a wonderful time when there was democracy and everyone was included. And then all of a sudden, Things got bad and there were fascists. Well, that's not the case. And the, 20, the history of the 20th century makes that really clear. In talking, talking about, about history, history uh, uh, I, would like I would like to go to a controversial point here in Brazil. Uh, uh, I watched very carefully your analysis of Stalin's role in the USSR. And in your work, you, anal you analyze that Stalinism is proof that communists cannot work given the, the maintenance of the status quo. Uh, in Brazil, a country in the outskirts, of the capitalist system, the figure of Stalin is acclaimed by many and hated by many as well, uh, within the left dividing itself between a rampant praise and a criticism full of anti-communists. Uh, what are your comments on the figure of Stalin? And do you think that there is a tendency for the first world communist parties to have a more emphatic critic over his figure and the third world country uh, actually reivindicate him a little bit more? Um, I think it's it's very clear that in um, Europe and um, the UK and the US that it's almost impossible to say anything even slightly positive about Stalin, right? That, um, at, but now I want to qualify that, particularly on the white left. If one looks at black people in the US Communist Party from you know, the 30s, 40s, 50s, and then afterwards, right? Even in the 60s and 70s, when um, most of the kind of so-called Western left or Western social democratic, Western communist left was fully 100% anti-Stalin, um, black communists were like, like there, there was um, a guy named Hosea Hudson was like, Joe Stalin ain't did nothing to me, right? It's like the black communists were much less likely to join on this anti-Stalin um, bandwagon in still, um, in, instead they were more, they, they, uh, continued to value the ideas of national oppression that had been part of the, um, communist, um, the, the communist platform in the United States. And they got credit to, they gave credit to that, to Lenin and Stalin and the common term for interest for emphasizing national oppression and re, and not treating racism just as race, but treating at treating um, black anti-black racism in the U.S. 
as a struggle as in, in terms of national oppression. And so because um, Stalin was had this general association, the anti-Stalinism that's been so pronounced in the um, you know the mainstream of the U.S., particularly since the Cold War, and then since the McCarthy era, and then since the secret speech of Khrushchev, um, that's not sh it's not as shared, right? So there's so once you start looking at um, you know different groups in the U.S., then even this the, the general thing everybody's anti-Stalin kind of starts to um, to go away. Okay. So I think, but but for the most mainstream, and then I would say now by mainstream meaning the so-called progressive left and the so-called um, progressive white left, that to bring up Stalin is to automatically um, make any kind of communism illegitimate, right? They think commun they think that Stalin proves the utter corruption, bankruptcy, criminal, totalitarian nature of communism. And in fact, that's why I think they're so invested in the figure of Stalin, because they can use just, just you know, use um, Stalin as a weapon to attack communists of any sort. Right. As a scarecrow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Or straw man. Straw man. Yeah. Yeah. And talking about the, the figures, the revolutionary figures, and a little bit about body you and the theory of the subject in revolutionary body, in your article, the subject of the revolution that has been translated to, to Portuguese, uh, you argue that the task is to create the body that can find the people, placing the people as the subject of politics. So what is the main difficult in, difficulty in achieving this task today? Um, it's really hard to build a party. Right? Just organizing is hard. And I think that um, for some um, I'd say for some young people, particularly sort of like the, the late 90s and the first decade of the 2000s, there was um, the kind of fantasy that, oh, we don't need um, organizational forms like the party. We can just use the Internet and we can cr um, connect to everyone online and we can have a blog and we can have a website and we can have networks and all of this. And so the kind of detailed face-to-face -face organizing work wouldn't be necessary anymore. All you really need is media. Well, that's people don't think that as much anymore, but that brought in um, a kind of added, and it's the wrong word, a set of practices that were not as oriented towards doing the face-to-face -face organizing work and reaching deep into communities. Now, of course, this doesn't mean everybody, right? I mean, there've always been groups or like really committed organizers working with populations. So I'm not trying to disparage those people. I'm trying to talk, describe here what became more dominant and what became more visible and why it became harder to reach people. I mean, organizing is is difficult it's time consuming and when the economies you know when the economies are becoming more and more unequal when capitalism is intensifying people don't have as much time right maybe they have to work two or three jobs they don't have the time for politics that they have when there's somewhat of a um, social welfare net or social welfare state so organizing becomes harder so i think that um you know that the, the real problem has been a sense that organizing is not necessary, and then the disintegration of the conditions that let people have the time for organizing. And those two things work together to present a real problem. I mean, and and then we've got to be, be honest. It's also the case that, like, real people in real parties can also be hard to work with and difficult. Like, the le leftists don't do themselves any favors when they are condescending or rude or sexual harassers or uninclusive. I mean, they're real problems that people have tried to point out in parties. And whenever those problems aren't addressed, it weakens the entire organized left, right? It means that the entire organized left is turning people off from doing the kind of committed work that we have to do. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And talking about these problems, uh, does the difficulty of placing the people as a subject of politics implying the lack of camaraderie that you point out in your article in Jacobin, uh, is the advent of personalism, as we were talking about Stalin, is this advent of personalism getting in the way of seeing the revolutionary leaders of the past as agents of the collective? That's a really good question. That's really interesting. Um, 
I think that the, um, I like the way that you anchored the kind of um, loss or problem of, of, of camaraderie or comradeship, that absence as part of the reason it's so hard for folks to see a kind of, of the political promise and power of a revolutionary people, right? And, and, and the reason for that is because we don't have the collectives that are strong enough to evoke that and produce it both at the same time, right? So um, we think, for example, like, like one of the things that happens, let's say there's a cool event or like a really important um, action that happens. I'm thinking maybe like one example from the US is this summer during the George um, Floyd protest, there was a, um, a demonstration of over 100,000 people in Philadelphia. It was one of the biggest demonstrations of the summer. It was huge. But then what starts to happen is people start to unravel and critique the very demonstration rather than saying, oh my God, people are coming out outraged. This is an amazing, let's now push the people forward. And still like, well, you know, some of those people didn't know what they were going to, or some of those people, you know, this is their first demo or you know, that many were liberals or whatever. I mean, they like people start to unravel it or criticize it. And then you're back at square one and you have to keep building and rebuilding. So I think that these tend to, and so, and what, and, and, and what's the motivation behind this, this kind of criticism or unraveling? It's a lack of comradeship, right? That makes people undercut the organizers who put it together and undercut the potential of all of the people who came out. Mm -hmm. Organizing is obviously a, a very difficult task, and I'm asking you right now as a journalist, leaning comments on the principle of building a collective newspaper, which would function as a collective organizer itself. And for you, what is the role of journalism today for the communists? And does Lenin concept of collective organizer still apply, or should we look for other forms of organization? Um, I think for sure the concept of collective organizer um, still applies the real one of the questions is does it um can, can we extend it beyond um newspapers to podcasts and radio um youtube um all the various kinds of media that's produced right now um that goes beyond like print media and i get, i think the answer's got to be yes the the challenge here is the difference the different orientation between recognizing the media work and the journalistic work as collective organization and thinking about it in capitalist terms of we got to get so many hits, we got to get advertisers, we've got to get money, we've got to do these things. Because those are two really different orientations. Um, one of them really thinks about an entire media sphere and wants to position left wing media within that. The other one instead sees people that can be mobilized and thinks about the work primarily as a collective organizer. So I think the orientation is different, right? Because if you're thinking of reaching everyone, you might not have something that's going to talk about Stalin. You might not have something that's going to be very explicit on the need for communist organization. Um, but if you think of it as a collective organizer, then you do. So I think that um, that in fact, it's actually been really exciting over the last few years to have this um, flourishing of, of far left media. Um, that's now, because it's there's it's reinforcing each other. People start to see um, themselves, their movements. They see actually people as potential, com and they can, they don't always, but they can see people as potential comrades. So I think that the, um, the collective organizer part is now starting to become really manifest in, in um, left online media in ways that weren't, say, totally apparent like 10 years ago. And this media advent uh, allows us here from Brazil to to follow the other the other position of the communist parties and the socialist parties, and looking at the talking about the U.S. and the recent election of Joe Biden, uh, we always see here in Brazil the positions of the PSL, which are very punctual and correct. So I want to ask you, what role does PSL play in the American class struggle, and what are your comments in general about Biden? So. First of all, you know, um, PSL is, uh, as you know, a party committed to the inter international, inter intergenerational, um, you know, multi-gendered working class, right? So we are right there in 
as a um, communist revolution, communist slash revolutionary socialist party engaged in anti-racist, anti-imperialism class struggle. First and foremost, like that's our that's our commitment. We're a revolutionary party. Um, you may not be surprised to hear that on the U in the U.S. It's not enormous. <laughs> it's not like you know, like the mainstream parties like Republicans and Democrats, but we have a um, a strong presence. I mean, I think we may be one of the few remaining revolutionary um, socialist, um, revolutionary communist parties out there. So that's really that's um, that's important, and we uh, have been building a really terrific media infrastructure to um, to support this work. So that's you know that's PSL. On Biden, I mean, Biden is a, an imperialist. He is has been a politician of the capitalist class, for the capitalist class, happy his entire career to work with white supremacists, to author um, the, the crime bill. Um, so I'm, you know, he's, it, it's an, one of the two um, capitalist imperialist parties. Um, the one that you know, one lost, the other one won. That doesn't mean he's one hundred percent the sh the um, the same as Donald Trump, but it also doesn't mean that this is something. It doesn't like you know, all the liberals are like, oh, phew, everything is fine now, and you know, I think that um, all of us on the communist side are like, oh, really? Right? How is this going to be fine for all of the you know? Um, working class people who have, you know, the, what is it now? Over 9 million people who have become unemployed. What about for all of the um, people who have no health insurance, right? The fact like that Biden has been very explicit about no um, Medicare for all. So I think that, um, you know, he's, it's just our position. He's a, he's a, um, a president of the capitalist class and for the capitalist class. Mm -hmm. And talking about this capitalist class and looking at the budget of the Pentagon, uh, managed to the anti-communist and anti-China propaganda. I would like to discuss a little bit about China. Some people here in Brazil like to discuss that China is not actually a socialist experience. It was in the past, but today it's not. So what what is the point of view of the revolutionaries in the U.S. about China? Because we know that U.S. propagates a lot of anti-China propaganda. So do you guys consider China a socialist experience right now? And do you think that China can offer something to the revolutionary struggle in the U.S., in Brazil, in the third world countries? I think that the, the, the most important thing to recognize is that in no way should um, anyone ever believe U.S. propaganda, one, and in no way should we um, abandon or neglect or discount the um, communist experience and legacy of China. And so, you know, that they have, um, have had to make various choices economically, um, you know, is unfortunate, but that they have historically, that they have a communist party, that this is part of their self understanding that, and that they recognize the long haul of the struggle for building um, communism is all important. So I think that the um, the the key orientation vis-a-vis -vis China has got to be: do not fall prey to U.S. anti-imperialism's attempts to demonize um, the other major country in the world. Recognize this country's successes. But don't be um, like successes, but I mean, like with respect to COVID, with respect to a lot of their um, um, projects um, internationally that are helpful in building and helpful in supplying, um, say, vaccines and infrastructure to other countries. But but also we can't be, um, you know, it's this isn't Mao for crying out loud, but it doesn't But we shouldn't in any way join in any kind of um, demonization of China. I think this is my last question, observing the pandemic situation right now. Uh, we all know that sometimes in history we have the moments that we think that we can act so we can move a little bit in our struggle, in our class struggle. You can see in Russia, the 1905 and 1917, when the provisional, provisional government and the Duma were all screwed up and, and kind of this kind of stuff. So talking about the pandemic, do you think that this moment right now the capitalist, the capitalist countries failed to contain the virus. 
actually US, Brazil, and etc. So do you think that this is the moment that we can reivindicate communists and put the communist ideas into circulation again? Because uh, uh, here in Brazil, talking about communism is almost like a crime, you know? You talk about communism and the first point people are going to say, oh, communism doesn't work and that's it. They don't accept the circulation of ideas. And we know that hegemony, hegemony is not only everybody being a Marxist, right? In Soviet Russia, not everybody was a Marxist, not everybody was a Bolshevik. So how do you establish today hegemony, the circulation of ideas of the communists as something normal? And you think that, pande that the pandemic, the advent of the, the virus exposes this lethal contradiction in the capitalist system that can't hold because the, the, the capitalist system, of, of course, generates a lot of contradictions that itself cannot they, they cannot solve these contradictions. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right about the contradictions of capitalism and how they are more visible now maybe than they've been in a decade. And they're, and it's like visible and, and palpable to the vast majority of workers. I mean, like in the, in the U.S., freaking COVID is like a, a, a genocide, right? Black and brown and Native American people have been really disproportionately um, impacted. In fact, uh, especially um, Native American communities, like all of their elders who know how to speak the languages that, you know, they're infected and dying. So it's, it's the, the, you know, con the race slash national conditions of this um, virus are very, very clear across the spectrum of the working class. Now at the beginning, um, there was a lot of celebration and holding up of essential workers for their sacrifice. That's pretty much vanished in terms of, well, everybody's got to get back to work and, you know, just get your vaccine. And, oh, look, these billionaires made a lot of money. So there's a, been a kind of dissipation of the strong sense of appreciation and gratitude for workers that I think was actually an important moment of the early part of the, um, of, of the pandemic. So what does this mean? What this means is that simply being aware of the contradictions is not enough, right? As communists, what we have to do is organize people so that they feel strong enough and able to fight, you know, basically to fight, to be willing to struggle to um, change the system, to eliminate the system that produces the contradictions. And that means that people have to be actually have to have a think that there's something they're fighting for and that they can do it. And I think that that this is the part where the left needs to focus more. So we're used we're like every worker knows that they're screwed by the system. Right? That's just that's part of of, of, of working class consciousness. What every worker does not know is how exactly can we combine together to, to change it fundamentally? And, and what are we changing it into? So how do we change, how do we bind together and what do we do to change and what do we change it into? Those are the things that we absolutely have to push. And I think that um, in fact, one of the things that the communist legacy is, uh, makes, is important here is a centralized approach. Like some part of the problem has been these capitalist countries like the U.S., U.K., Brazil has been the approach has been utterly fragmented, utterly market oriented, just totally so that the experience of the pandemic is completely different for the very rich and the very poor, right? For the, you know, the, the bankers versus the workers, it's been terrible, but we've got to channel that knowledge into the conviction that struggling and struggling against it and overthrowing it is possible. Mm -hmm.